Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the guest house. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy. A depression. A meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Entertain them all? Entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows. A crowd of sorrows? A crowd of sorrows who may violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. Honorably? Honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought? The shame? The malice? Meet them at the door, laughing. And invite them in? Invite them in. Invite them in. Be grateful. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Please be sure you're in speaker view and that your microphones are muted. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the guest house. Welcome, come in, sit by the fire, be at home, be at peace. As you can see, um, our intention in this year's Living Sufism is to be perhaps a bit more creative, imaginative, to engage other aspects of our imagination, of our hearts and our minds in perhaps a more creative, playful way. Because the topic that we're engaging is so serious and so profoundly important, we think, that the best way to approach it is lightheartedly. Welcome, welcome to Living Sufism. As part of our effort to continue to innovate within this series, uh, we will be emphasizing more than in previous living Sufism years, um, the experiential aspects of our work together. I'll say more about this at the end of our meeting today, um, more about the ways in which we hope to generate experiences for us and among us that will help us deepen our appreciation of what we're doing here together. To begin, let's, let's refer to the framework that we have offered in the video that we sent you. If you haven't had a chance to look at that video, please do so. It's on the landing page of livingsufism.com, and you can also get to Living Sufism website through the sufiway.org site. Under programs, you'll find a link for Living Sufism. Please view this video if you haven't already when you have a chance. In that presentation, we're proposing that while there is in our contemporary world a very lively and I think important debate now going on, if not raging, about the nature of reality, that ultimately the reality that really matters to each of us is the one that we're living every moment of every day of our lives. That is the reality that we should be, I think, concerned with.
And we're proposing that that reality is relational, that it is generated through our relationships. And by this, we mean not just our relationships with others, which is typically the way I think we, we think of the word relationships, the, our relationships to other people. But no, there's a whole field of relatedness that we're living in all the time. There are many different dimensions of relatedness. For example, my relationship to myself, to my body, to my thoughts, to my hopes and my fears, to my reactions. Somewhere there is a central awareness that relates to those things and that shapes the reality that I'm living every moment of every day of my life. Of course, the relationships with our friends and families and associates and community members and neighbors, of course, there too, there is an adab to be practiced in that, in those relational spaces. But that's not the only relational spaces. We also relate to the world that is not physically immediately available, the world of ideas, of political parties, of distant wars, of the climate crisis. We have relationships to those things as well. And of course, there is that ultimate relationship to the, to the beyond that sends these guides to the guest house. What is the nature of our relation, of the reality that is being generated through our relationship with the beyond? To approach this reality, the one that we're living again every moment of every day of our lives, we're suggesting that we think in terms of the refinement of responsiveness in all dimensions of our lives. The refinement of responsiveness doesn't mean that there is just one ideal response to any situation, of course not. The refinement of responsiveness is a quality of heart, a quality of awareness that we bring to every moment of every day of our lives. We're suggesting that if we need some guidance, if we need a guide, if we need a principle, if we need an ideal to help us in the refinement of responsiveness, rather than thinking about good or bad or appropriate or inappropriate or correct or incorrect, we think about adab. Adab is an Arabic word that usually means something like courtesy, manners, thoughtfulness in relation to others. And it can also mean the morality, the value system, the ethics that uphold a particular community or society or civilization. These are all very useful and helpful um, understandings of the word Adam. And yet among Sufis, as there always is, there's another story being told. There's a deeper essence being sought. There's something more transcendent potentially in play. We can see this, for example, when we think of the Sufi message of Hazrat Inayat Khan, it is often described as the message of love, harmony, and beauty. All three of these human capacities are interactive. They are relational. Love, obviously. Harmony, making a whole of parts. Beauty is a particular response in a particular moment. They're all interactive. They're all relational. Now we could say that at the heart of Sufism, there is something that we could call a Dom. Closer to home, if, you're, if you've been reading Pierre Elias's wonderful book, The Love Scrum, and I highly encourage uh, the reading of that book. Love's Brum, in, in a way, is a series of essays about, in a sense, about Adab, because in it, Elias invites us to think about how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to our aging bodies, for example, how we relate to the, the true self within us, how we relate to the world around us, how we relate to beloved community, to the events of the world, and most centrally, how we relate 
to the natural world. In a sense, Elias is inviting us to consider the refinement of our responsiveness in all of these relational spaces. If I had to, you know, give a, a term that would describe how we're thinking of Adab and how we've been working with the notion of Adab in developing this program, I would say that we could, that Adab is mystic awareness in action. Mystic, mysterious, <laughs> undefinable, magical. Awareness, the core of being, as Elias and, and the open path work have, have, have demonstrated, the core of being is this awareness, sometimes called pure awareness. Maybe you call it the witness, the observer, the soul, but it is awareness this core of experience, mystic awareness in action. This is so important. <clears throat> it's easy for us who have been interested in spirituality, who are interested in human development, to find ideas satisfying. But in the realm of the Dab, only action will bring a result because if reality is relational, it's all resulting from the way we respond to what comes out our way. There's a very wonderful entry in the bowl of sake of Hazra Dinayat Khan. It says, peace is perfected activity. That is perfect, that is complete in all its aspects, balanced, in all directions and under the complete control of the will. Now, in today's language environment, we might have a little bit of an issue with the word will. So I would say we could consider that Inayat is telling us, peace is perfected action that is perfect that is complete in all its aspects, balanced in each direction, and under the auspices of awareness. It's this kind of um, imaging of Adab that we would like to begin with. Um, our, our, our process will be that over the course of this series, we will explore the refinement of responsiveness <clears throat> in a number of relational spaces. Today, we will begin with the inner life, how we relate to our own responsiveness, what is the quality of our responsiveness. In the second session, the intimacy, we will explore those intimate realms of loved ones, intimate partners, intimacy with the beyond. And we'll look at the vulnerability and transparency and presence that creates this possibility of Adab within those relational spaces. In the third session, it's called the gathering. <clears throat> we will explore Adab in the interpersonal spaces, our friends, our families, our neighbors, the people we meet with on Zoom and so on. How can we practice Adab within those spaces? The fourth session is called The World. In that session, we'll explore the Adab of relating to everything that's happening that isn't physically present with us, you know, the, the world of political parties and institutions and distant wars, the world of climate crisis, the world of ideas and literature and so forth. We are in continual relationship with all of these things and the nature of our reality is very strongly influenced by how we respond within that man-made, human-made, constructed world. And most importantly, how we relate to the world the natural world, the existing world. You know, we're in a continual relationship. Every time we breathe, 
It's a relationship. The refinement of that relationship can manifest um, very significant changes in our reality, the refinement of breath. So this is the, the sort of where we're, where we're going in, in this. Um, our intention is not to offer you a code of behavior. No, our intention is certainly not to say, this is a dab, and if you do these things, you will be a good adab person. No, that's not our intention at all. In fact, don't, isn't, isn't it so that just like our own voice, each of us has to cultivate our own authentic, true adab, and that that adab will change over time. It will, just like our, our natural capacities to relate change over time. And so rather than saying, this is what a dab is and we should follow these principles, our intention here is to generate explorations within these relational fields so that we can become first more aware of our responsiveness and how that responsiveness generates the reality we're actually living every moment of every day of our lives. Secondly, we'll look at what does it mean to refine responsiveness? How does one refine responsiveness within a particular relational space? What does that mean? How does, how does that happen? And again, this is not something we can tell you. This is only something that can be discovered. And so our hope is to generate explorational spaces and experiences where that discovery can take place. At the end of the day, if I were forced to say, well, what, what are you really doing here? Why, why are you doing this? I, I would say, well, doesn't it follow that if my reality is generated by my relational skill or lack of skill, that if I can improve my responsiveness, my reality would change? Doesn't it follow that two, three, four, five, six months, a year from now, I might be living a different reality altogether if I'm able to bring some sensitivity to how I respond and some skill to how that is expressed. Would it not be possible that as time goes on, I will be living a reality that is more aligned with my truth, with my happiness, with my well-being and the well-being of those around me. That's my agenda. If you would like to take that one up, I still invite you. To begin this process, we're going to, we're going to explore the inner life or inner adab. And to help us with that, let me invite Angelica MacArthur Klein. Angelica? Thank you. Thank you, Puran. So hello, hello and welcome to a practical exploration of inner adab to begin with, to begin this journey. The refining of our responsiveness to our own inner life, perhaps guided here and there by Rumi's suggestions in the guest house that we began with. But as, as I'm speaking, I encourage you to think about what do you think inner adab might mean? What might it look like or feel like at the moment for you? What does Rumi mean when he talks of welcoming all of our experiences, our visitors, even if they are a crowd of sorrows, some joyful but others may be sad, malicious, self-pitying, impatient, and so on, ashamed. Inner adab, we're suggesting, can be thought of as a process of welcoming and refining in time, our inner relationship and our inner responsiveness to all of these visitors, these different aspects of being human so that we can be curious about them all and listen 
to all of the different voices inside us, invite them through the door. Invite them to introduce themselves, maybe explain why they have come and perhaps what gifts or messages they may bring. Of course, the inner, inner the, the refinement of um, inner adab is most challenged when the, when the uncomfortable visitors show up. Who wants to welcome in these feelings of shame or guilt, uh, the darker thoughts of one sort or another? Because, of course, the fear, the very human fear, is that once allowed through the door, these darker thoughts, these unwanted visitors will take up residence, become more real in themselves, more dominant, even take over the house, take over our sense of identity, our sense of I am that feeling, I am this experience. So when that fear is in play, Sometimes we'd rather shut them out, leave the door closed, hope they'll go away, cover our ears, our eyes, sing harder, pray harder, focus upon welcoming and entertaining the preferred guests, the joy, the laughter. But of course, as we know, behind an inner closed door, unwanted visitors of our experience tend to keep coming back. They keep knocking, they keep ringing on that bell, they keep tapping on the window insistently to remind us that they are there. Yes, they want to come in, they want to be heard. As if they know that they have something important here, something they would like to offer us, some kind of message perhaps or guidance whispering through the keyhole that their messages, their gifts may be of equal or even greater value at times than some of those more welcome inner guests. The joy, the laughter, these are wonderful. But if only the, the darker guys were allowed in at times to speak for themselves, maybe the wonder would be even greater in the end. Of course, here's a caveat. Sometimes we know it is right to leave a sorrow or a difficult experience outside for now until it's the right time when we are ready and able to entertain a particular visitor, a particular darkness. And perhaps the being human skill there is to simply recognize that Today is not the right day. Better be kind and gentle to that visitor without opening the door. Perhaps gently promising to return and welcome it in at another time. Okay. So let's let's start to gear up for, for our breakouts. But first of all, um, if you have a pencil and paper, get it to hand. And um, I'm going to offer a couple of situations just to sort of chivvy up a few of these visitors, invite them along to, to knock on the door and, and see how that goes. In the breakout groups in a moment, after I've offered you a couple of situations, um, I will invite you to gently and simply share with each other in turn a few of your inner visitors, if you want to, your own inner voices or reactions that might have been um, triggered, invited, that might appear uninvited um, in response to the everyday examples that I'm going to describe. And, you know, let, let's be, as Puran says, let's be less interested just for today in, in the good and the right responses. And let's be more interested in our true responses inside. 
let's start this journey about reality being relational from where we actually are, from what actually arrives inside. Because to the extent that we can tolerate the range of different aspects of ourselves, we will make an authentic step forward along this way of inner adab and then outer adab, of welcoming and honoring each and every guest for what they have to bring to the table. Here's the first situation. Imagine a homeless person or remember a homeless person in your life who sits somewhere outside on a street near you, maybe opposite a local shop that you often use. You walk by that person very regularly and you anticipate walking by because you know they're going to look at you, look you right in the eye and they're going to ask you through their eyes or through their hand for a contribution. What aspects of yourself inside you arise on such occasions as you're approaching that homeless person who appears to be in need and to be wanting their need to be met by you? What arises in you as you anticipate that encounter as you walk past? What are some of the difficult voices that you notice and you have to somehow relate to inside yourself on such occasions. I'm going to give you a few seconds now to, to be curious about that. The second situation is this. Every time you're with a very much loved friend or family member, every, try, every time you try and have a harmonious and loving exchange with that person, they insist upon being negative in one way or another, blaming you, picking fault, picking some kind of argument with you, refusing to resonate with your loving tones, arguing their favorite point. What's, what can that be like? What kind of inner voices, reactions do you have to contend with, might you have to contend with in your imagination or in reality at times in such a situation? Take a few moments to write down a few voices, feelings that you recognize in response to these or these kinds of situations. <clears throat> okay, so in your small groups, the exercise will be simply this. Take turns to express in a word or a short statement, a few of the kinds of inner reactions that you just noticed or are aware of in these kinds of situations. Voice a few of these inner reactions, which may come as thoughts or feelings, sensations or images. If you feel like being playful, you might even find the quality of that voice, find the energy behind each of the reactions you decide to share. And I encourage you to see what it feels like to use the word I for each voice you offer. I feel this, I feel that. Just for now, give each reaction 
an identity, your identity. We will take about 15 minutes to, ex to express in turn these inner reactions. And if there is still time, you might like to start thinking together about your current inner relationships to the voices that visited you. And of course, feel free to just show up and smile in your breakout group without saying anything at all if you don't feel like it. I'm sure your simple presence will also be very welcome, even if you'd rather not speak out loud. So let's go into the breakout groups now. So welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, if you could please make sure that you're still in speaker view. So as we land back together, uh, I'd like to suggest that we just take five minutes to close our eyes and pay attention to your inner state now. How do the inner reactions, the inner voices feel about being shared, being spoken, or being summoned. Are they okay with that? Are they reacting more or are they, do they quite like the attention? And how do you feel, the essential you, about letting them in? Do you agree that they may be bringing gifts or messages that are very worth letting them in for? Does that feel true to you? Take three minutes to pay attention to that, those questions. Let me welcome you from your contemplation now as we continue our exploration of what we are calling the inner adab. In the guest house, Rumi says, every morning a new arrival. Well, let me tell you of a, a recent morning I had with several unexpected arrivals. I'm in a coffee shop having a cup of coffee and a blueberry scone and reading a little bit in the relatively early morning calm. I slowly become aware that there's a group of young women gathering at a larger table near me. I say young, but only relative to me. They are, it appears, mothers gathering together on some mission with plans for an event in the lives of their children. They are enjoying themselves and rather loudly. As my anticipated peace is being undermined and then disturbed, some visitors begin arriving into my little guest house and I slowly grow restless, glance up, then return to my reading. Then more distracted, I lose my place and, and my focus back to reading. I begin to feel tension in my upper body, slumping my shoulders inward as I mull the noise and the uh, inconsideration of this group. And even slightly, if one can slightly, I feel the first pangs and pains of anger. Somewhere along in this experience, I become aware that this is happening. I begin to see these arrivals, these visitors, and hear their voices almost seeming to come from my mouth. And as I slip from one to another and then back to my reading, I begin to see that there is a sort of forgetfulness 
which is the playing field in which I meet up with each of my visitors. I settle in momentarily with one and another in those in-between times and spaces when I lose my thread to read. Now, as I am somehow more aware of them passing by, I grow less restless and more patient. I recognize them and in the recognition, they do just pass by. Another stopping in for a moment. At some point in my brief experience, I hear these excited and now I see mothers and caring friends and I hear their enjoyment and their laughter. And for a moment, I smile and laugh as well. I also know though that in that moment, the laughter I suddenly enjoy is not the end of my experience, rather yet another visitor, another momentary voice. Now, as it is time to leave and I make my way to the door, I, I glance back to my now empty table. I have left it and so have I see my various visitors into my guest house, my restlessness, my tension, anger, my enjoyment and my laughter, they have all left as well. I no longer hear any of those voices. I imagine we may meet again sometime, but right now as I walk to my car, I am full of attention caring that I don't step on the wet and slippery leaves on the walkway. As I've reflected on this experience in the day or two following, I find that I don't spend much time considering or wondering why those particular voices arose, at least not in terms of any past stories from my life or habits derived from my long lifetime. Rather, I recall the last line of the guest house, be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So rather than analyzing the why as it relates to my past, I see it is more interesting to wonder where are they guiding me? This wonder comes with a bow to an inner adab, which accepts that which has arisen in any moment. Perhaps that bow will allow me to keep the door to my guest house open and welcoming, not peering through the keyhole to see who is there, trusting the offering, the offering the next visitor brings. Before you enter the next small group, take a moment to sit with your experience thus far. You may have taken some notes. Perhaps some situation has come to you that has stayed with you. Some visitor seeking your attention, a, a voice to be heard. And one last thought. In considering that our visitors, with their voices seeking attention, as Rumi says, sent as a guide from beyond, I ask this question. What language will a guide from beyond be using when its voice arises? What language will a guide from beyond be using when its voice arises? So you'll be in your small groups again for 15 minutes. And as we know, there is a timer on your screen. So now as you join your triads, perhaps bringing some situation that has arisen for you, Allow yourselves to be with one another in a spirit of sharing, trusting, exploring the guiding light that may appear. We'll go into our triads now. Welcome back, everyone. Please uh, return to speaker view if you're not there already. And, and again, please be sure that your microphones are muted.
Thank you. So we want to take some time to talk about the exper experiential elements, which in my view are crucial to this work together. Again, relationship is activity. And so we need to work in the realm of action. So there are a number of ways that we're going to support this, encourage it, and, and frankly, invite and maybe even gently, lovingly insist that you do these things. Otherwise, um, the benefit won't, won't be uh, uh, as fruitful as it might be. So first thing is that we are going to have, as we've had in the previous years, a very robust web presence for this program, for the Way of Adab. On Tuesday, it's our hope and, and intention to send to all of you an email with a link to the recording of this session and a link to the web space and some additional instructions. Um, th this web space will be important in that it will be the repository of resources that we don't have a, a chance to cover in the, our live sessions. So there will be a lot of material there uh, in addition to the recording of the session, which I believe will be helpful in keeping us in the way of the <clears throat> most, uh, most important in terms of the experiential aspect of this program is the formation of small groups. Our hope and intention is that you will participate in a small group of six or seven people that will meet uh, in the intervening time between the sessions. So let's say two weeks after the Sunday session, two weeks before or thereabouts, that the small group would meet basically to share your experiences, to explore this together, to enable us to find our more authentic understanding, our own personal understanding of Adab, and to help each other in how we cultivate refining our responsiveness in all of these relational spaces. So the way that we will proceed to do this is that we will invite you, I'm inviting you, to let us know if you wish to participate in one of these small groups. Our hope is to be able to form them within time zones so that you can all meet at a time that's convenient for all of you within a particular time zone. And you'll be invited to meet once in the month for an hour or so on your own. We'll also invite one member of that group to, to work as the convener of the group. So sending out the Zoom link and, and so on, and making sure that you stay on track. If you wish to be part of such a group, and I highly encourage it, even if you feel some resistance, if that resistance is a visitor that's coming to you right now and saying, I don't like to do that. Well, think about it, feel it a little bit more. So if you wish to be a part of the group, we're going to ask you to send an email saying, I want to join the group, to adab at sufiway.org. We'll put these instructions also in the email that we send you on Tuesday, so you don't need to absolutely remember it right now. But it will only be a matter of sending an email, say, yes, sign me up. Uh, and this, as part of the program, you will be invited to participate in that group. You'll need to let us know before the end of this week. So by Friday this week, please let us know. After Friday, we can't guarantee that you'll have a spot in any of the small groups. And then our hope is that in the beginning of the following week, we'll be able to notify each of you as to what group you're in and when you will have your first meeting and so forth. Again, this has turned out to be, we've done this over the last few years, as some of you know, in Living Sufism, and the feedback we've gotten is that it's one of the richest parts of this experience, to meet with others in this kind of group setting, get to know each other, get to deepen your understanding in that kind of communion and communication. So please, consider it. Um, in addition to that small group, Every month at the conclusion of the session, like now, we're going to offer a chilla and an exercise. 
For those of you who may not be familiar with the term chilla, chilla is a Sufi practice where the leadership or a teacher offers a particular challenge that is usually pretty difficult, often kind of strange. And that challenge is to be performed as sincerely and as, 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 as thoughtfully and carefully as possible for the purpose of enlivening something which may or may not be apparent immediately. In addition to a chilla, we will offer an exercise. So here, here are the two things that we're going to ask you to do this month. And being a grandfather, I can say, you should do these things. Of course, whether you do them or not, entirely up to you. God bless you if you do that. It's not for me. That's fine, absolutely. And you should do these things, really. The first one is a chilla that is extremely simple and extremely challenging. In this chilla, you are asked at least for one hour every day, at least for one hour, you can do it longer if you can, if you want to, but at least for one hour every day, abstain from using the first person pronoun, I. This is a long-standing chilla used by spiritual traditions for centuries, if not millennia. So many spiritual traditions use this. Why? Because it's extremely effective. It is challenging. For many of us who, that's just part of the way that we talk. Many people, God blesses me, I'm certainly one of them, will often begin our statements with, I, I think, I, I believe, I wish, I don't, for at least one hour every day, for the whole month, abstain from using the word I. There's more instructions on the website and some very interesting perspectives on why this practice has been there for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's a very powerful practice. And you'll see, if you, if you can perform it, you, you'll, you will no doubt experience some of that, I believe. So that's the chilla. And again, all of this, the instructions will be available on the web space. The second is an exercise. It's actually a game. It's called the game of the guide from beyond. And it is basically following on from what we've done today. It's playful. It's meant to be fun, but it can also be extremely profound. I won't describe it here because it's a little bit there's several steps involved, but you can find the instructions on the web space. And again, play this game. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of game where I believe you will be surprised by what comes out of it. It's not what you expect it is. This is my suggestion. And finally, uh, we want to practice a dab with you. This is relationship. And so what is our adab here? Part of our adab in this space is our wholehearted invitation that you talk to us, communicate with us. You know, if you have questions, if you have suggestions, if you have reflections, if you have experiences you want to discuss, if you, if you have resources that you think would be helpful to others that, that should go on the website, please send them to us. All you have to do is send, send an email to adab at sufiway.org, A-D-A-B at sufiway, one word, dot org. Um, one of us, or maybe someone else from our community may respond, but we will dearly appreciate hearing from you. And finally, just one reminder. This is about relationship. It's about relatedness. And our premise is that that's the basis of the reality that is being generated every moment of every day of our lives. 
The only possible way that we can deepen our capacity, expand our ability, refine our responsiveness is through doing that. And so whether it's with these chillas, with these exercises, with the small group, all of that, and maybe something else you think of, please, can we be aware of and responsive to opportunities that arrive in our life to practice a Tao? However, we understand that at this stage. And finally, just one more word. You know, this image of the guest house, this metaphor has served us very well. This being human is a guest house. Every day someone new arrives. I hope you can relate to that as strongly as we have. You know, it's like you, you never know who's going to show up. Suddenly you have this thought and like, where did that come from? And while we are certainly saying here, Rumi is saying something so important. Every visitor is a guide from beyond. We also must reckon with the fact that not all visitors are welcome. You know, and, and it's all a matter of what am I ready to deal with? What am I willing to deal with? Somebody shows up at the door and, and I can see and feel, no, I'm not ready for that. I don't want that. Don't open the door. Decide for yourself. That said, please let us recognize that being uncomfortable is often a, a pointer. It's something that we need to deal with. So it's not just about being uncomfortable. It's when, when you feel that your tolerance levels are being breached, your boundaries not, yeah, you know, not all visitors are welcome. There are times when something shows up and either it's clearly not something you want to deal with or you're not ready for it or you don't understand it. That's fine. Don't open the door. Don't do that. Go back in. Sit by the fire. That said, please let us heed Rumi's words. And please let us follow the guidance that we've shared here today. So to close our experience, Isha, why don't you send us home? Thank you, Paran. To close, I'm going to read a poem from Jean Rana from her, her book, 25 and 9, Quest Poems. It is called simply Pontoon One, Notes from the Open Path. Across the mind, without abiding anywhere, could there be, could there ever be more than now? Mind will create a path, destroy it. Who is it who had this thought? There is never more than now. What direction are we going? Show me the one who is thinking. We're on a path without spiritual tradition. What direction is anything going? Nothing depends on it. This is the path of every spiritual tradition. Utter spontaneity, constantly reoccurring. Everything depends on this, chopping wood, carrying water. Everything depends on this. Chopping wood, carrying water. Spontaneity constantly repeating, total fidelity to the unknown. Destroy the path the mind creates. Abide without abiding anywhere. Abide without abiding anywhere. Thank you. Until next time, blessings be.